Por muchos años, cripto parecía el futuro. Hoy muchos se cuestionan si cripto tendrá un futuro y cómo será. Menos participantes, mayor injerencia de reguladores, los recientes debacles de mercado han lanzado una poderosa sombra de duda sobre el porvenir de esta innovación tecnológica en los mercados. Para discutirlo, es un honor presentar la mesa panel Crypto Markets Crisis Global Outlook con los distinguidos panelistas Karina Caudillo, gerente general de Ripio, Jim Falby, managing partner en Falby Consulting, José Rodríguez, fundador de Blockchain Land, Miguel Díaz Díaz, Head of Toronto Center del BIS, y como anfitrión, Brett King, destacado autor de Banking 4.0 y reconocido futurista del sector financiero. We welcome Karina, Jim, José and Brett to the Digital Banking and Financial Technologies Forum 2023. So, I'm Miguel Díaz and I'm the traditional sector within this panel. So, I've been a central banker all my life and now uh, my job is to try to generate innovation within central banks. So, The BIS, uh, the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank of the central banks, uh, generated this new initiative in terms of trying to identify the new technologies that could help central banks to push forward uh, the digital financial ecosystems around the world. And uh, my job is a little bit to try to track different technologies on, on, on this side of the world and uh, try to put them uh, forward together so that the different central banks ha can have a, an easier access to the new technologies that are being developed. And uh, my relationship with crypto is one of uh, love-hate. Uh, on the side of the love, it is an amazingly beautiful uh, technology that can do away with trust. And then on the other side, uh, you have trusted entities that can basically provide the same functionality for societies with a much lower cost. So that is a little bit my, uh, my view of things. And BIS just produced a, a, a brand new report, just came out uh, yesterday, I think, which is on crypto and CBDCs and all of this. This is very, very interesting. Um, Karina. Yes, the mic working? Yeah, yeah just low. Um, my name is Karina Caudillo. Um, Right now, I'm working at Ripio, which is a crypto exchange that has presence in several parts uh, of the world. And before working at uh, Ripio, I was working at BBVA, um, leading the blockchain uh, implementations for the bank. So I got to see uh, the inside of the bank trying to get on top of these technologies and then move to a fintech company, a crypto fintech company um, that's trying to make it easier to access crypto for everyone else. And, uh, um, you know, we, we mentioned Revolut briefly uh, during the presentation. One of the secrets to Revolut's success in, uh, in Europe, and particularly Central Europe, has been offering crypto custody and the ability to access uh, crypto in those markets, because a lot of the traditional banks didn't, because they were worried about what the regulators were going to say, um, and so Rev Revolut went into that gap. So um, we are still seeing, even despite the crypto winter, we're seeing this as a, a successful strategy. Uh, Jose. You're, you're more on the infrastructure side with the blockchain, but tell us, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I think I'm one of the first entrepreneurs in Mexico and Latin America in the blockchain space. Uh, last year, I, it was 10 years and I, since I started in this industry. I have participated in some of the first companies and events here. <coughs> um, for example, I was a VPN partner at Bitso, which is the largest exchanger in Mexico. I run Blockchain Land, which is an event that we did uh, for 13,000 people in Nuevo León with the uh, Nuevo León governor and with Binance. I also help, uh, and well, we also run Talent Land, which is uh, next month. Here in Talent Land, it's the biggest innovation tech and business event in Latin America. We've had over 60,000 people attending and over 100 speakers there. And besides that, I have been uh, investing and developing different things from regulation, working with governments in Mexico and Latin America, uh, changing uh, some, some laws, and I run some businesses too. I have a 
Bitcoin ATM company. Next week, you're going to see it in Paseo Interlomas, Arcos Bosques, and Forum Buenavista. I also um, uh, run uh, help with business development in, in some companies. For example, with Binance, we broke the Guinness World Record of the biggest class of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies last year. With BitPhoenix and Tether, which is the biggest stable coin in the world, I have helped them launch their MXNT, and I help them with business development. So I work with various um, initiatives, events, and, uh, and I also help organize La Bitconf, which is the longest running uh, uh, Bitcoin conference. La Bitconf just turned also 10 years. So well, very happy to be here and Great. To continue the helping develop here in Latin America. And Jim? Yes, thanks, Brett. My name, well, Jim Falvey. And uh, I am an attorney in addition to doing consulting work. I've been working in financial services, law, and consulting for too long to remember. Um, if you saw my picture, you can tell that was taken in the early years. And now I have gray hair, gray beard, and that's what this industry can do to you sometimes. That's true. <laughs> Look at my hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've worked in a variety of capacities as well. Like Karina, I, I've worked uh, for a few exchanges, in, including the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Um, the, uh, I was the first general counsel at the Intercontinental Exchange, uh, or ICE, which now owns the New York Stock Exchange. And I also uh, worked uh, for an overseas exchange, overseas from the US, uh, and that being Eurex, or what, which is owned by Deutsche Borsa. Um, as to crypto and blockchain, I actually got into this world initially via blockchain. We were trying to build a clearinghouse for um, products, actually for ordinary, uh, not ordinary, non digitized products, uh, corn, pork bellies, treasuries, what have you. And um, that, that was my entree in uh, around 2013. From there, I've, I've worked for a crypto exchange. Uh, I've uh, consulted on a number of projects. And um, great. it's been a great mix, great. So, including litigating against the SEC. Which is always ah, there you so, go. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Well, of course, the SEC now is is taking a, a, a really heavy-handed approach. So, um, Miguel, um, you know, one of the things that we've seen in in respect to uh, the whole crypto market is the argument for decentralization. But with the collapse of FTX. Um, there's a very real question being asked whether this decentralized element can survive. Uh, you know, where are regulators coming down on this? So it, it, that's, a, that's a really good point, Brett, in terms of uh, just understanding the true decentralization nature of the whole movement, no? because we talk about crypto and we talk about many things that are not really decentralized or that have many points that are not decentralized and as such generate certain uh, risks that can generate problems. My perspective is that if you see the evolution of the crypto market and you compare that with the evolution of the traditional financial sector, going back to the beginning of this century, you can find many things that are very Many similar. parallels, yeah. So you can see the issuance of private money and how those collapsed, the volatility on the price of that privately issued money, the entry of central banks to provide one type of currency so that the volatility would go down, the intermediation by banks or deposit takers, the similar uh, thing to stable coins, for example. And once you go that line, you start realizing that the decentralization movement, the, the, the powerful, really pure decentralization movement that could generate an alternative to the traditional financial system is quite narrow when we compare it with what we call the crypto market as a whole. Now, when we start going into the, the centralized parts of, of this new market, so FTX is a very clear example, it's a centralized entity uh, disguised as a decentralized solution. And once you start getting into those things, you start needing some either regulation or someone to provide security for the users or prudential regulations so that some guy does not go to the Bahamas to spend the money of, of the rest of the people that are giving them the money. 
Uh, so it is, it is quite important. I think there's a lot of hype in terms of, of the decentralization movement. There are many things that are very useful and that I think could, could really change the way in which we see the financial markets and the financial sector. But we also have several things that need to be taken a little bit more seriously. Uh, so issuance of currency, uh, uh, taking deposits from the public and so on, that needs to take a level playing field from the regulatory perspective and making, for example, just to give you a clear example, take stable coins. A stable coin is a deposit taker. So they take money, which is either money that is digitally represented by a bank because you have to send a transfer, or they can even take cash. And they give you a digital representation of that money. That is exactly what a bank does. That is exactly what an e-money issuer does. But they are running in a decentralized database. And just because they are running with a different da database, they do not have to fulfill the prudential regulation. And that doesn't make sense, because the risk is exactly the same. And therefore, what I see in the future is that authorities are going to take a little bit more of a functional approach, saying if you take deposits and generate, generate this type of risks, then you need to have the same regulation as a bank or as another deposit taker. So I see different uh, uh, um, institutions, different authorities, pushing a little bit in that direction to generate level playing fields so that these new technologies are not an ex excuse for arbitrage. Of, of regulation that is put there to protect the users and to protect the financial sector. Jim, as a, a sort of general <coughs> counsel, if you're working for Binance or Coinbase today, um, you know, what would be your advice to the team there to, to sort of deal with these coming uh, trade winds of regulation? Yeah. That's a good way to put it, the trade winds. It's there's a lot of wind at, uh, at uh, the institutions that exist now, uh, from Coin, Coinbase uh, to Binance. Um, I certainly would tell, I would advise the client to uh, tread lightly. Um, and I would be in fairly regular communication with the various regulators about what we're up to ensuring them that we are uh, in a good position financially as well as market-wise. The other thing uh, that I would be very careful of is that you don't, if you're not registered yet in the U.S., and both of these entities are, but it's, Binance was reluctant to get regulated in the United States, so they um, it, it's a little unclear of their status and if they are properly using that license or if they're, to use a, 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 another term, commingling the rest of the world with the United States. Um, Coinbase has gone about it, in my view, the, the right way, has sought out regulation, and it doesn't have to be heavy regulation, uh, but but it will be now, uh, post uh, Sam Bankman uh, free. But um, I would, again, I would make sure that we had all our ducks in a row. If we find something that's problematic, I would bring it to the regulator initially uh, and you know acknowledge what you what your situation. Uh, they you get points uh, for for uh, demonstrating um, that you're uh, doing your own due diligence, essentially. Um, so, again... I mean, the, the amount or the lack of self-regulation that, yeah. that FTX and Almeida, you know, demonstrate is, uh, is appalling. You know, they're, they're now they're calling him SBF, they're calling him Sam Bankrupt Fraud now. Right? So, <laughs> That's sadly yeah. true. Karina... Um, you know, being in the industry, in the space, and working for obviously a, a crypto player in the space, how has, um, you know, the, the, the crypto winter, as, as it's being called, how has that um, been reflected in terms of the strategy and the business? And, you know, are, you know ha have you had to adapt or, um, you know, how's that washing out? Yeah, definitely. Um, before, and I think this happened to almost all players, before the crisis, all of us were trying to uh, 
get to as many countries as we could, trying to capture market, get more users. And right now, uh, most of the players are trying to retract and focus on the main uh, countries that we already have, uh, trying to get our product in a better position, uh, trying to um, project and implement more security so that the users know exactly what we're doing with their money, um, show them our research so that they know we actually have the money that we say we have. Um, I mean, this is probably something that we sh should have done a long time um, right. ago, but usually when something bad happens is when everyone starts pushing on having more security, on having more transparency. Um, something else that we are doing is um, we're seeing that a lot of the big companies like Nubank, Mercado Libre, are trying to also get into the market. And those are huge players. So it's going to be very, even more competitive, the buying and selling and um, holding of crypto. So what we're doing is trying to be the technology behind those companies. And with our current products like the wallet and the exchange, what we're, what we're doing right now is um, focusing more on the technologies or the future of crypto that no one else is seeing, like Web3, basically, uh, Metaverse, social fi. That's sort of what we're doing, trying to be more specialized uh, with our product and having our B2B products that are uh, the backbone of the new bigger companies that are coming to the field. Yeah, it's funny, you know, when you hear the crypto, when you go to crypto events like, you know, uh, blockchain events and so forth, you hear talk about Web 3D or Web 3 all the time. The crypto version of Web 3 is very different from the traditional version of Web 3, which was Web 3 was the, the 3D representation of the internet. That's what Web 3 means, right, in terms of its definition. So things like VRML and other things that were developed back in by Tony Parisi and guys like that, Mark Pesci and those guys in the early days. But in terms of infrastructure, Jose, um, you know, obviously you're involved in, uh, on the blockchain side and more of the infrastructure side. Obviously, you've been in Bitcoin, you've got your ATMs and so forth. But from a technical aspect, um, none of what's happened in, in terms of FTX and so forth is, is a technical failure, is it? It's, so there's still you know, robust application of blockchain. But in, in the meantime, what is, what is happening in the blockchain um, space in terms of moving to proof of stake and you know, all of these other things that is going to help us from a regulatory transparency and uh, you know, organizational perspective? Yeah. I, I would say like going back, unfortunately, there's a lot of opportunists and scammers in this space. So most of people that come here and, and for example, launch a token, do a, a platform like FTX, they're opportunists and they're, they're scammers. Uh, Sam Bankman and FTX is not a crypto industry or a crypto company. It's a company that used to do FX and then integrated deposits and withdrawals with, with uh, crypto and, and stable coins. And afterwards, they started going all, all that mess. Uh, and also, uh, something that is very bad in that case and also happens in Mexico and Latin America is that they bribe the president and their, and their party, which is unacceptable. I mean, I, what, if you saw that, like, uh, I, I used to work for... Uh, investigation services and send uh, and here in, in, in Mexico and in the United States so you see a lot of corruption and you can bribe people and no one goes to jail so even Sam is in his house he should be in jail and you see some pathetic things that are very mean like for example the regulator they're asking the Democratic Party and Joe Biden and everyone to please send back the money they shouldn't be asking for please send back the money they should be taking them and also investigating them because that's customer funds that they're using that it comes from a crime. They stole funds from customers. So that is something very bad that not only happens in the crypto industry, it's overall in the financial banking industry and central banks. Uh, if you see the amount of money laundering that happens every year since over a decade, it's one to two trillion. I mean, how can no one see that? And we stop about 1% of money laundering globally in the banking system. And, and, and We're woefully bad at preventing it. And, and you see the, the, the crypto money laundering reports and it's 20 billion. You see, it's, it's what, 2%, less than 2%, that's nothing. It, it shouldn't be happening either ways. 
But well, that, that, that's something that shouldn't happen. And this guy, honestly, they, he should be in jail. His yeah. partners too. And everyone that took money from him, especially those donations, should also be investigated. I mean, that, that, that is illicit funds that they're using and they should be uh, brought back. And also, well, go, going back to the regulations, I mean, like they said, there's, there's some arbitrary uh, regulation that he did, going to the Bahamas, opening a, an, another entity, etc. Most of the crypto companies honestly try to avoid that, especially in the U.S. Actually, what is happening is that U.S. is being isolated from the world because yep. they're imposing laws that are obsolete and not made for this right. for this uh, right. for, for this industry. Like, for example, the, the last week when they said everything except Bitcoin is a security, I mean, or either you are a regulator, Gary Gensler, that doesn't know what a security is, and that guy should be, in, from my point of view, that guy should be investigated in jail too. Yeah. I mean, all, all the meetings that he had with FTX and all the bribes that he received, I mean, why is it? He, he shouldn't be in that position right now. Correct. Definitely not. Uh, and, well, there, there are things that should happen. I mean, first of all, th let's put things apart. One is the companies that run this and integrate this technology, and the other is infrastructure. You can leave Bitcoin for 10 years, and nothing will happen. No one will steal it. No one will hack it. No one will take it. There's no way. If you don't have your private keys, for example, if you have a, a collection of, of the very old coins of Cassassius, you can have it there for other 10, 20 years. Nothing's going to happen. Those is really the centralized uh, technologies that you are actually becoming your own bank and you can have your self-custody and no one can touch that money, only you. No institution, no government, no, no uh, bribe, no, no people extorting you, etc. cetera. There, there's no way of taking that out. That technology for me in Mexico and Latin America has been great, also in Africa. Most people don't have access to banking. Most people don't have access to financial services. Most people don't have access to an ATM, a card, etc. So that is one of the use cases why uh, it became uh, the, uh, a legal tender in, in El Salvador. They had over 80% 80, 80, 80 on bank. In Mexico, you have over 50% on bank. And banking is not the solution, and banks are Correct. not the solution, and government is not the solution. Solutions is, is doing uh, innovative things like they did, like things that are really easy, like here in Mexico, giving correspondence licenses to OXO and 7-Eleven if you have any, any, any corner. That solutions, for example, gives you as much as having twice as much ATMs or access in the world. Those are things that have happened. And, and as, as they have mentioned, uh, what crypto companies do is try to integrate the solutions to make uh, cheaper and better financial access and to give these people that will never have probably financial access or people that need it or people that need to transfer money internationally or any kind of solution that they currently cannot do a solution. So what do you want to do? First of all, yes, protect your customers and when they need to use these services, that their money won't be missing. I, I mean, it's unacceptable even for one cent to be taken in, in, in Mexico and in most parts of the world. If you take one cent from a customer that needs to be reported, you need to send it to authorities, etc. It needs to be public. It's, if it's internal money, then you're going to try to hide it and just pay a fine. But in this case, it took, it took customers funds. I mean, that, that, there is, that is more uh, serious stuff. But, well, going back to that, there are lots of, of companies that have been doing it very well. Uh, Binance, for example, as you mentioned, they were trying to run away from all regulations. There's no way that you can operate in most countries, like in the U.S. Now in Mexico with the fintech law, in Colombia they're doing a fintech law, running away from regulation. I mean, you, you can do it in some countries and continue operating, but now in everyone. Binance had to do it. They have Binance US. In Mexico, they have hired also regulators. In Latin America, they're doing that. Uh, for example, now that I've been collaborating with Big Phoenix Tether, they thought that they could go around. There's no way to do it. And there's also important things that you need to comply in order to avoid uh, all this all this happening. So what, what we need is better financial systems, better access, and for people to have the certainty that when they use their products, that they, they will have a delivery and other things. Do not store your your money in exchanges. Do not store your money in third parties. If you store that, you're always going to have, doesn't matter if it's Binance, if it's or whatever, all of them have been hacked or will be hacked. So only leave there what you want to exchange or what you want to use or what you want to pay. For the rest, you can use a lot of, of, of wallets. You can use your own wallet, your custodian wallet, physical wallet. Oh, that's a new business. I just partnered with Ledger too, so I'm going to be... Well, you know, N Nidig, as an wow. example, in the U.S. is, uh, you know, now um, 
you know, enabling many smaller banks to get do crypto custody there. So they've made a big, you know, they raised a billion dollars in 2021 for that. So uh, big news. But is is the decentralization experiment over? Is that what you're saying? Or? No, 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 of course not. I mean, there's more users in Mexico in Binance and in Bitso than in most of the banks. Uh, right. Uh, there's only three banks that have more users than here and then, for example. And Mexico has big banks. Uh, but Citi, BBVA, Santander, uh, they, are, they are the few that have more users than them. That's on one end. And the other, like, I've, I've been traveling all over the world looking at this, and Venezuela, Colombia, Argentina, you use Tether, you use stable points, you use Bitcoin Lightning Network, you use Binance Pay. You don't use banking, you don't use uh, Bolivares, you don't use, use Colombian pesos, you don't need Argentina pesos. Those are solutions for, for people. I mean, they're in a situation like Mexico was 20, 30 years ago, which is your money is going to be worthless at the end of the year. Your money is going to be trapped. So what are you going to do? You use this. And most of the what I've seen, crypto companies are focusing a lot of Latin America and Africa to develop all these use cases. And first of all, to bring all this access to all these people. And a matter of cost, also technology has been amazing and how it has evolved. I mean, all the layers that have been construction, for example, having uh, the Lightning Network, which makes payments also with no cost. And although I don't like blockchains like Tron, uh, most of the activity in, 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 in stable points in Tether, for example, is on in Tron because it's almost zero cost. Yeah. Karina, um, you know, part of the challenge we, we have with Bitcoin, crypto, and so forth is people have been speculating on the value of the currency. The world that Jose is talking about is where we're using cryptocurrencies as an alternative form of money. But this requires lower volatility. It requires the fact that people want to spend that money and use it to transact instead of holding it. Um, do you see that we're making a transition to that world where crypto will be used for value exchange instead of speculation? Uh, what Jose said is very important. Like what happens in economies like Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela is, is showing us that people are using more stable coins just because they don't want to be exposed to the volatility. So yeah, I, I totally see more people using crypto for the daily payments. What we see in Ripio, specifically in Argentina, is that when, they, when our users get paid, everything, they turn it into crypto, into a stable coin specifically, <coughs> because they're trying to get around the blockages that the, the regulators are doing. Like they, they What's have, the most popular stable coins that are being used? Um, USDC, USDT, USDT yep. DAI. Um, and the thing in, in Argentina and, and in this like very strict uh, countries in terms of the acquisition of uh, US dollars is that they, they have a cap of how much USDs you can acquire. And by going into crypto, they don't, have, the cap. Money, they don't have any, any yeah, cap. Yeah. So, we're allowing them to be inflation free, sort of speak, um, thanks to these technologies. Obviously, the government is not happy with that, and then tr they're trying to look for ways to impose fines or to pressure you not to be offering this to the users. But in the end, we as companies, we are not only trying to make business, but we're also trying to give alternative to our users. So, we're going to be doing anything we can to, to help them move money around, uh, have cheaper commissions when they're moving money out, out of the country, uh, easier ways to, um, like Jose said, like be in control of your money. Yeah, if you can't, I mean, at a central bank basis, if you, like in Venezuela and Argentina, if you can't control inflation, then, yeah. Jose, um, you know, uh, sorry, um, Miguel, um, Part of the debate now is over CBDCs versus crypto, as if they're sort of interchangeable. You know, this is how the press treats it. But actually, CBDCs and crypto serve very different purposes. Um, but how do you see this panning out? Where, where, is, where does CBDCs fit? Will they coexist with stable, stable coins and crypto in the future? You know, um, where do you see that evolving? So, again, I'm going to take the position of, of, of looking at history. And uh, let, me, let me start by saying that a central bank provides money, and money has three characteristics. It's a unit of account, 
It's a, a reserve of value and it is a mean of exchange. Now, central banks have provided money for a very long time, right? So we have had bills and coins that have allowed us to, to transact in our daily lives uh, through time. But with a digital economy, this becomes really obsolete. So the central banks, in order to continue to fulfill their role as providers of money to an economy, we need to evolve and we need to generate some, uh, some sort of digital equivalent to that money. So that's the CDBC response uh, by the central banks to the digitalization of the economy, of course pushed a little bit by, by some of the decentralization movements. I would like to make a very clear distinction here because again we're talking about cryptos as if everything was the same. USDC and stablecoin is just a deposit taker in dollars. It's as if you would have Bank of America receiving dollars and allowing you to spend these dollars around the world. The difference between one and the other is that uh, they're using different databases to hold the balances of the individuals that are putting their money in there. So they are using a cryptographic element and a blockchain and a distributed ledger to keep your balance. But in the end, the financial responsibility of the issuer of the, of the USDC of, or, or an issuer of a stablecoin is the same as that of Bank of America. If you want to get your money out and get actually bills and coins, uh, you need to get an off ramp and you actually need to do this, this, uh, this, this transfer of value. And this makes this stable coin providers a very clear example of a potential bank run. So if someone in the back is not keeping the sufficient amount of dollars to back up the issuance of the dollars in the stable coins, they will have a bank run. And this is essentially what is being happening with the smaller issuers of, of, of stable coins. So it is very important to make that distinction. A stable coin is not necessarily the original nature of the decentralization movement, which is, which is quite much more profound, I think, and much more interesting. If you think about a Bitcoin or, or an Ethereum, you have a very different concept. And this, this comes from a, from a completely different perspective and view of the world. I think the stable coins and this type of provision is just a, a, a centralized or a, a, a traditional financial institution disguised with a new type of keeping ledgers. And we need to, to open our eyes to that. So it's not just what a CBDC, if a CBDC is replacing one thing or the other. We need to understand that a stable coin is just another way of, 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 of having a deposit taker in our economies. And we need to, to, to be careful with them. Now, in terms of, 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 of what has been said, I agree that, that uh, whenever you have a jurisdiction in which you don't have a trusted authority or you cannot rely on an authority to keep things well going properly, controlling inflation and so on, it makes a lot of sense to have a fully decentralized element or to tap into another country's uh, uh, currency. So this happens. Ecuador doesn't have a domestic currency. They go to the US dollars. Do we need the stable coins to do that? Do we need the crypto to do that? No, not really. There are different ways of, of providing this. And for cases in which you don't have the trust, so take a, an example of a country in which you don't have institutions, of course a Bitcoin solution or some other value generating uh, uh, implementations <laughs> might, might be a, a very good option out of that. Now, CBDCs again, to take back the first point I said, is, is just the next step or the logical step for the central banks to continue providing societies with the services that they are created for. So, so central banks need to provide money, and the only way to provide money for a new digital economy is to provide actually some, some, some uh, digital form of, of bills and coins. And of course China is well advanced in this. 2014 they started their CBDC trials. Yes. The US is still debating whether they're going to have a CBDC. So the U.S. is significantly behind. But China likely is going to tie the CBDC to uh, transactional activity on the Belt and Road in the future, particularly with smart contracts. Now, um, you know, uh, Jim, uh, this sort of era of smart contracting and the need for programmable money, can you give some sort of legal insight in terms of how smart contracts, you know, in the future will operate and, and why that's such a big deal, particularly for things like supply chain automation. Yeah, the smart contracts are, um, I forget who, who provided this example, but it, 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 it's, 
We already have it. When you look at a vending machine, for example, it's, it's very simple. You, you put your money in, uh, you, you figure out what you want to order, push a button, it comes out with any change. That is essentially a smart contract. Um, they can get much more complicated. Um, it's funny, I, uh, another commentator said, smart contracts aren't smart and they're not contracts. And I disagree with that based on, again, the vending machine <laughs> example, but all the way up to complex transactions. Now they're, they're ideally, you would prefer to not have interaction of anyone once the smart contract is initiated. The, the, the benefit is it's fully autonomous, right? Yes, it, that, <laughs> correct. They're, they're, it, it, as we get there though, there, there may be needs, a need for an, a little interaction here or there. Um, but generally, yes, fu fully autonomous is the example. Um, now, or the, the goal, rather. Yeah, now we have uh, Ethereum. Um, you know, Vitalik was one of the first guys to talk about smart contracts. You mentioned, Jose, the Lightning uh, Network and, and so forth. Um, part, part of this is that these new rails that are emerging, um, you know, we have to trust that we can put a smart contract over the top of it and it's going to operate uh, efficiently. But um, are we making progress in terms of the transaction volume that can be handled on blockchain? Because that was a limitation in the Bitcoin world, you know, in particular, you know, on the blockchain of Bitcoin. You know, are we, are we getting more transaction volume through these blockchain networks now? Really? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, well, depends. Not, not everything is a success story. Uh, actually, in the words of that's something that I'm going to uh, be speaking. There are some protocols like Uniswap, OneInch, Sushi that operate more than most of the banks in the world. They operate uh, billions uh, uh, every day. So those, there are big success uh, stories. But you also need to take into account that it's relatively uh, still new technology. And that it's, I, I, I still, although I, I love this and I have been investing and I'm, uh, I'm most an investor that I'm speculator inside of this, there are lots of risks besides the ones that we've taught and the other is, is the technological risk. Uh, like they mentioned, uh, smart contracts can do uh, some specifics and process transactions and type of transactions for, who, for which they have been programmed and they can do it very well. And one of the protocols that I like is MakerDAO that substitutes completely a stock exchange, a central bank and a bank. You can create your own digital vault and ask for a, for a loan at two in the morning on a Sunday, even if it's, it's 25 of December, and you're gonna you're gonna get it. Now, how how do you attack these protocols? You attack them from another side. You, you attack them from a technological side. You, you attack them from the price feeds. You attack them from exploiting the contract. You attack them by giving too many calls so they cannot uh, handle them and then uh, modify it. There's a lot of things that can also go wrong in this context, and that's also why it's very important to, if, you, if you're gonna use any of these protocols that you are seeing this uh, wild return of investments that you're getting a thousand percent each, each, uh, each month or something like that, probably in the short term that's gonna work, but in the long run that is, that is not sustainable and it's also most probably gonna be attacked and, and it's not gonna be. So you, you see a lot of uh, things that even in, in the large protocols there have been failures. Not only hacks, getting into the contract and stealing the money, that's hard. But for example, one of the first uh, and biggest hacks was the DAO. That, that's uh, when Ethereum right. was born. That was one of the biggest equity crowdfundings in the history of humanity. That was crowdfunding with Ether. And Could you explain what a DAO is for yeah, people that DAO don't know? DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. So you have this uh, concept of the smart contract of having an interaction that can do uh, if you do A, you're going to have B. If you deposit A, it's going to be invested. If you deposit A, you're going to have money in your vault, and then you're going to have a collateral. You'll be able to to do uh, to do uh, to ask for a loan because you will have a collateral. So essentially, it's an AI-driven company, yeah, right? So Instead of driven by humans, yeah. it's driven by computer code. Right. The DAO integrates. Uh, 
a, a, yes, a, a contract, but also governance, and also, uh, let's say, that a society that al allows them to vote. So when you see all these tokens that they're issued, they're not securities. Many people, when they buy tokens, they think that they're buying security. Uni, Uniswap is not uni stocks, et cetera. What you're doing is having access to the protocol to potentially vote on this. So what happens in DAOs, which, which is very uh, interesting, they have big budgets. They have 100 million, 1 billion, 2 billion, 5 billion. And you can decide in these DAOs through the smart contracts, how you're going to vote and how these budgets are going to be implemented. So, for example, last week there was a, a MakerDAO, which is a protocol, one of the biggest and largest running DAO was going to give a hundred million dollar loan to a bank, and the bank asked them for a loan, and they rejected it. Why? Because most people voted against it. So then you have uh, organizations and companies that instead of going and, and having a proxy, having uh, people get together in, in, and do a large meeting, you have this voting, which anyone with these tokens can have and take decisions, and then you have all these parts to do, yeah, an organization or a company that runs. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, this form of company, a, a distributed autonomous organization, is going to be a lot more common in the future as we find ways to create vehicles for running smart contracts, uh, presumably. Where do we sit in terms of the legality of a DAO right now, Jim? It's hazy. And, and the, well, the issue in the US is, probably many of you know, we have multiple regulators, not only at the federal level, but we have 50 state regulators, and there are often more than one regulator within those two systems that want to claim control over these particular items. Um, I, so when the original Dow case came out, that was uh, sort of the, the SEC putting a stake in the ground saying, okay, we, we know what's going on with crypto here, and it appears that everything is a security, even though it's not. Uh, the Howey case back from the 20s, I think it is, um, is just not. It's like when the only tool you've got is a hammer, everything yes. looks like a nail. That's it, the security exactly. side. Exactly. Right? So it's particularly challenging in the US right now, and, and especially after an event uh, like FTX imploding, you know, you look at examples, uh, what happens after a big event, whether it's Enron, whether it's 2008, et cetera. Um, it, it, all regulators, all legislators want to do something. And it, it's often not well thought out um, regulation or, or legislation. I was, I worked on a, on a, um, bill uh, that is trying, that the legislators are trying to pass in New Jersey, which uh, to your point on ATMs, Jose, that, that was the thing that, that initiated the-, the A uh, Bitcoin ATM thing? Or? Yeah, there were some uh, constituent called into their legislator and said, hey, I got ripped off by this uh, ATM. And uh, that was enough for this legislator to create this whole system for New Jersey. It's not law yet, but it's, there hasn't been much opposition. And again, that's the issue with, um, you the, know. The regulators aren't the most innovative organizations on the planet. Miguel, um, you know, the CBDC stuff, obviously China has, has um, made some traction there, but we hear talk about wholesale CBDC alliances now, like the BRIC nations and, and uh, so forth. If you're going to have programmable money, it would stand to reason that you would need to have shared regulation around, you know, the operation of CBDCs. Are we seeing that, um, like we've seen with GDPR becoming sort of a a rule for data privacy that now the US has had to adopt and US organizations have had to adopt. Do you think in terms of the evolution of CBDCs that what's happening in China, for example, and these regulatory, uh, um, sorry, these regional <coughs> plays is going to reshape the way we think about regulation? Are we going to lose sort of country-based regulation and go for more regional-based regulation? 
I, I, I don't think so. Let me, let me just say one comment in terms of, of uh, smart contracts and programmable money, because I, I think it's important and it's not, not always discussed in, in fora. Think about what happened in 2008 with the financial services. People were buying things that they really did not understand very well. Yeah. And it ended up kind of... A, in a the CDOs and stuff, yeah. It, it ended up in a kind of difficult situation worldwide. Now take a complicated financial service. And on top of that, use a complicated technological element in the back that can be written by myself or by anyone here. And just think about who around this table, around this, this, uh, this fora, can actually understand whether there's a backdoor on one of these uh, uh, programmable contracts. Yeah, yeah. Because one of the characteristics of these things is to be uh, Turing complete, which basically means that you have basically all the powers of a computer in that, in that particular uh, uh, contract. So in the end, we might end up in a situation in which people will be buying stuff that they don't have any idea of what it's doing. And that's very frightening, and that uh, needs to be taken care of. I don't know how, but, uh, but it is quite important in terms of, of, of uh, we, we always talk on the positive side and how things can be straight through, and uh, the money will just pass from one person to the other, and they will do exactly what whatever the, the salesman told you it would do. But uh, on the unhappy side, when you have a, a guy that is putting backdoors on the, on the contracts or, or that is doing things that are susceptible to attacks, such as what Jose explained, we are kind of in, in, in a problem. And, and most of the people, even technically advanced people, cannot see the little pieces that could be, could be very damaging from a financial perspective. Now, I wanted to say that on the smart contracts. In terms of what you asked regarding the, 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 the Chinese and then this uh, platforms that try to generate a, a simpler cross-border transaction, again, and I'm going to be repeating myself once and again, the problem with cross-border transactions is not about technology. It's about policy that different jurisdictions want to put on their own countries. But that's the point, isn't it? It's like you've got all these different regulations that don't align, and Binance is able to arbitrage that yeah. by saying, well, we're in this jurisdiction, and so it doesn't matter what the US regulates. But that, that doesn't really work when you've got a sort of global platform, right? That, but that is why, that is exactly why there are many of these uh, stablecoin solutions that are not yet uh, uh, controlled or, or corralled by, by regulation that are using that arbitrage power to actually make the money flow from one place to the other. Yeah. But that takes us to a very deep question. It's a question in terms of, of whether we want our jurisdictions to have their own regulatory set. And that's a, a very basic axiomatic question. It doesn't have anything to do with technology. It has to do whether we want policies that are implemented on a country-wise perspective, or if we want a more global world. Because when you see the cross-border transactions and you see all these protocols that are being uh, developed, so the Enbridge uh, or, or uh, many, other, many other projects that are within the innovation hub being developed, and you go back to the basics, you still need some sort of correspondent bank relationship in the back to do the settlement correct. And that correspondent banking relationship, of whether it is at the level of the central banks or if it is at the level of commercial banks, they do need to agree on whether the money can flow seamlessly from one jurisdiction to the other. And this takes us back to AML But safety that's just an like algorithm that. in the future, surely. Not, not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. I think it's more of a definition by societies on what they want to vote for. If societies want a country that will stop transactions because they don't like money laundering. Right. And I agree with you in terms of the inefficiency of that, but that is a definition that has to be taken. But I mean, CBDC is an argument for, or is a mechanism trying to eliminate money laundering as well. That's part of the design not, not premise, right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It depends on the design. I and mean, even if you see the Chinese design, they have a tiered system. So if you manage low amounts of money, then you don't have to, to share your name or so on. We don't know exactly what's right. in the act, really. But it depends on how you implement a CDDC. You can implement a fully, a fully uh, 
pseudo anonymous, if you wish, a pseudo anonymous uh, uh, CBDC structure, or you could you could would be a big brother through your CBDC. But that's a definition that the central banks should not be taking and are not taking. That's a definition that is being taken by societies on what they want on their financial systems in the future. Okay. Well, so I've got a few minutes left. So here's what I want each of you to um, just take 30 seconds to, to answer this. Is Are we at the end of the crypto winter and are you, are you positive about where we're going to go or do you think there's still some growing pains uh, that we're going to see? Jim, yeah, 30 I, seconds, please. Great question and I, I, I think we're not out of the crypto winter yet in the United States. And we're, the U.S. Uh, is going to be regulatory, regulatorily arbitraged and other countries have a great opportunity to take the business. The good from the business, U.S. From the yeah, U.S. I agree. Yeah. Karina, we'll go to you first. So more growing pains. What do you think? I think we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, as long as it's not a freight train coming at us. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, but uh, what we are seeing is that we're going to have a lot of issues in terms of regulation, and we need to be super proactive and working with the regulators to issue uh, regulations that are fair for everyone in the, in the field, not only to protect the power of the governments or the regulators, but also protect the users and also protect the industry. Um, but yeah, I think this is one work. thing, actually, that crypto and fintechs do better than traditional organizations. They tend to be more consultative and transparent with uh, the players. But they also tend to be more experimental, you know, but yeah. that creates problems for regulators. Jose, what are your thoughts? I'm not so positive. I don't think so that we're going out. And uh, there's a lot of data that you can see around that. One of them is the volume that you have in the different uh, cryptocurrencies and in the different exchanges. Uh, volume is like uh, 60 to 90% lower than what it was a, a year ago, for example. The other is the amount of people that are being hired and fired. There are very few companies right now that are hiring. One of them is Binance, but the rest of the companies are either not hiring uh, or firing people. Most of them actually are firing people. Uh, so that is also uh, something that's very bad. Also, well, the regulatory part, many of them are going to be avoiding U.S. and other countries that are going to have more severe regulation that's going to make also the business implode. And at the end of the line, you also have bigger problems, which is economic problems. You have, you have countries like U.S. that have uh, inflation that is equivalent to Latin America that they have never had in, in, in decades. And you have the biggest issuance in the history of humanity of U.S. dollars, which the effect isn't there yet. So yeah. you're going to have more inflation and, and yeah. you're going to have more assets, but your money devaluating on the assets, not as much the assets going up in value against your money. So for me, we're not done yet. We're not there yet. And yeah, there's bigger questions, I agree, agree economically, as economies transition. Yeah. Um, Miguel, are we at the end of the crypto winter? Or? I, think, I, think, I think this is, this is just one more uh, iteration on the markets trying to identify the actual price of this. And figure things. it out, yeah. I think uh, uh, if, if you think about the, the fundamental uh, functions that, this, uh, that these technologies can provide, we're still not there in terms of knowing how much. They but we're going to need those technologies for the sure, future. For sure, sure. I, right. think, I think they will be important for many, for many uh, specific services. Uh, but, I, but I do think that this is a price discovery uh, uh, world. And within this price discovery, the interest rates that are out there are uh, draining lots of the capital that fueled most of these bubbles and these busts and, 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 uh, and booms. And uh, this uh, extraction of available capital to just throw away into crazy ideas will, will start becoming uh, uh, more constrained and therefore the prices might, uh, might have a little bit uh, more of a, of a shock down. Well, we're out of time, but I just wanted to ask you one final question. And uh, do you think, it, raise your hand if you think Binance is going to survive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's uh, because that, if Binance survives, I think we're out of the crypto winter. If they go okay. under, I think it extends it for a bit longer. Yeah. Please join me in thanking the panel for a great discussion. I hope you learned some things out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Hand back. <laughs>